everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Crazy stuff to talk about today. So we're continuing our unit here on citizenship and government. Uh, today, I want to tell you some stories and some situations that have happened um, in relatively recent history that really outlined the legal issues that can come up with citizenship and the government, how the government interacts with citizens, and where you get into these gray areas and really some situations that are baffling that they ever happen that you would think just wouldn't happen. But we're we'll kind of be all over the place today, but man, uh, you, sh you should enjoy this because uh, it's these stories are wild. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we got four stories here today, uh, some a little more generic than others. Um, the first story we're gonna talk about uh, deals with immigration. Now we've talked a lot about immigration, but it keeps seeing like, as I teach it, imagining from your perspective that uh, there's a law, but you know, it's either yes and no, good and bad, you, you broke a law, you kept a law. We're gonna talk about today a situation in which uh, Immigration, uh, our laws can get real confusing based on individual situations. Our first story today is gonna to be about a young man, and when I say a young man, it's a kid that's five years old, a kid named Ilian Gonzalez. Now, you probably never heard this story. Your parents, however, if you ask them about it, it's probably one of those stories that they were very aware of, and then after the story kind of ended, they don't think about it. So if you're like, uh, hey, Parents, uh, you ever heard of Elian Gonzalez? And they're like, you know what? I do remember that. So this happened in the late 90s. All right. But let me give you some backstory here. So this map here, this is America. The pinkish red island here is Cuba. All right. Now, America and Cuba have had some beef really since the 1950s. Um, the leader of Cuba is a man named Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro and Cuba are communist. America, especially during the Cold War, not a fan of communism at all. From really 1950 up to present day, relationships getting a little better, but so complete no contact with Cuba. Uh, Fidel Castro is here holding a paperback uh, in the 50s or 60s, I bet if you zoom in on that, you can tell the date, uh, says the plot to kill uh, Castro. We didn't even hide the fact that we were like, somebody needs to take him out. Uh, on the right is a more current picture of him. He has passed away uh, uh, recently. Uh, I can't rem remember exactly what, he, he may have passed away of cancer, but he was a, he was a very old man. He, he was uh, in charge in Cuba for like 50 years, all right? I was a general before that. Anyway, so America's not a big fan of Fidel Castro. Uh, so we don't, there's no trade, it's a trade embargo. We don't uh, communicate at all with Cuba and that's it, over and done with. Well, what about immigrants that are coming to the United States from Cuba? The problem is that the immigrants trying to come into the United States from Cuba, there's no way of getting here. There's no planes that come, there, there's not, nothing like that. Uh, and America in the 1990s, all right, uh, creates a law and it's called the wet foot, dry foot law. So immigration from Cuba ends up being very different from everywhere else, all right? Uh, so from 1966 up to 1994, any Cuban that made it to America got to stay, all right? Uh, it, was a, it was a refugee thing. There's a small island we can take the people in. Well, uh, in 1994, all right, because uh, the Immigration Act of 1990 that we had talked about had already taken place, uh, in 1994, they're like, I don't know if we just want to say basically open borders, even though it's water, from Cuba to America. So the United States government makes this policy that, so any immigrants that come here on a boat, if the Coast Guard stops them before they can get on land, they're going right back to Cuba. But if they can make it to land before they get caught, they can stay. So it is like a, such a life changing game of tag. Can you get to the beach in Florida, which is 90 miles away from Cuba before you're captured? Well, what happens after, uh, after this law is Cubans realize if they're trying to flee the communist society they don't want to be a part of, right? There's Cubans that enjoy being in Cuba, but there's a lot that want to leave. Um, if they can just make it to shore in Florida, they can stay. And that was the wet foot, dry foot policy. 
What that leads to are scenes like this. This is completely homemade rafts getting in the water and trying to float 90 miles across the Atlantic Ocean to get to Florida, all right? Uh, because if you can make it there, you're safe. If you get picked up by the Coast Guard, like here, this is a group of immigrants. If you get picked up by the Coast Guard, they take you back to Cuba, all right? And a lot of times those people will try again. Sadly, what happens a lot of times at, when they were doing this is this is what the Coast Guard finds. A homemade raft, nobody around. Because the boat broke and everybody that was packed on it drowned. Brings us to the story of Elian Gonzalez, a five-year-old boy. Elian Gonzalez, his, his mom, he lives with his mom. His mom and his dad are divorced. His dad is remarried. They all live in Cuba. His mom wants to come to America because there's a lot of refugees in her family that are already here in America in Florida. They get on a raft similar to this. And they're coming across and the boat collapses and sinks and they're all in the water trying to survive. Everybody drowns except for Elian Gonzalez. This little kid here, this is Elian Gonzalez. The Coast Guard picks him up. Now, in theory, he should be taken back, but since he was dehydrated and he was struggling, he is allowed to be taken to for, for medical help, which in this little random law allows him to stay in America. So this makes the news. People are like, hooray, I guess. The problem is, I, I say I guess because it gets, it gets touchy here. So Elaine Gonzalez's mom has died, who he came over with. So he's here by himself, you would think. But he has uh, family members here, older family members on his mom's side that are going to take him in here in Florida. Okay. Based on everything now, everything seems simple. Except Cuba wants him back. And here's why. Elian Gonzalez's dad lives in Cuba. His dad's remarried. He wasn't planning on leaving Cuba. Elian Gonzalez is like, what happened? Oh my gosh, I want my son back. I need, I need you to send, send my son back. And America's like, um, no. Because there's a lot of refugees in Florida who absolutely are not going to send this boy back to this communist country that they fled. And legally, he can stay here. But his dad in Cuba says, I want him back. And so there's a huge push from both sides over what to do with Elian Gonzalez. Uh, these are two pictures here I want to uh, uh, show you. So this is at the time, I mean, this makes national news, all right? This is Elian Gonzalez on the left, and he was absolutely used in all types of propaganda from both sides. This is him with a Cuban flag, an American flag, swinging just uh, all-American boy. Uh, and this is what would be in the American papers. Like, look how American Elian Gonzalez is. On the right side, that is his class in Cuba, all holding up pictures of Elian Gonzalez, like, we want our classmate back. Both sides were manipulating the media to uh, have this happen. And his dad is like, that is my son who does not have another parent because his mom passed away. I want him back in Cuba. So technically he should have with the wet feet, dry feet uh, rule since he was brought here by the Coast Guard. He should legally be allowed to stay. But because it caused so much attention, the federal government decided, no, we're going to send him back to Cuba. There is a massive outrage by the refugees in Florida who had escaped Cuban communism that did not want to give them up. And they said no. And they like put a fence up uh, around the house that he's staying in. The fence could have already been there. And when the government realizes, they're like, dude, we said he's going back. He's going back. So this is a photograph of the uh, officers bum rushing the house that Elian Gonzalez is in is in Florida to get this kid. And this picture I'm going to show you is an extremely famous picture. Uh, this is a real photograph. You talk about just one of the top 10, probably more famous pictures in modern American history. This is a like SWAT team coming because they don't know what they're going to fight. How much are they going to fight? So no, nobody was shot or anything, but that is Elian Gonzalez and one of his caretakers, one of his family members that are holding him as they are going to pull Elian Gonzalez from this family member to take him back to Cuba. This is the news, uh, pay, uh, the issue, the picture that is in all the newspapers uh, afterwards. And this just seems crazy. Like, 
Uh, now, nobody was shot here. No, uh, nobody said that, that they went in, they got Elian Gonzalez, uh, and it, it seems like a big win for Cuba. And it's just very tense because it's it pulls at your heartstrings of, of immigration, what to do for, uh, for a kid, what should happen. Um, and it really shows the gray area along immigration laws and how, depending on how we feel about a certain country like Cuba, we just completely make up a whole new immigration law for Cuba. Now, uh, I want to, in, in, in on a, a somewhat of, it's not somewhat, this is a pretty positive. So this is immediately after he is taken, he is given, his dad, uh, it, it meets him, I, I didn't realize his dad had like flown to America, like the show of goodwill by Fidel Castro, let him charter a plane, come to America, pick his son up. So this is uh, Elian Gonzalez's dad, who has his son, takes him back to Cuba. Uh, oh, let me back up. Uh, the, the, the picture on the right is uh, Elian Gonzalez with his dad and his stepmom and his half brother in Cuba. But being a big win, this is Fidel Castro. He was, he's old at this point. Uh, with Ilinga, he's a national like hero in Cuba. There's a lot of people in Florida that were very upset about this, uh, about him going back to Cuba. And if you're like, where are they now? Which I just looked this up uh, uh, doing research. And I was like, oh, cool little end to the story. Uh, two pictures here. Uh, uh, on the left is Ilian Gonzalez when he was 15 years old. All right. Uh, so that is uh, uh, Ilian Gonzalez uh, on the left there. Uh, the picture that says exclusive ABC News is a, a picture from ABC News of present day when he's 26 years old. Uh, all right, because uh, this happened in, in 1999. Uh, he's 26 years old. This is him with his wife. And the reason they have this new picture of him is Elian Gonzalez is expecting his first child with his wife, uh, who lives in Cuba. He's a college graduate for, uh, from Cuba. He has visited America. Like, it really ends up being like, 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 of kind of oak. Like, granted, his mom drowned trying to be a refugee. But the actual story of Elian and everybody was so horrified about what would happen to Elian Gonzalez turned out to, to be okay. Um, but the question here is, why wasn't Elian Gonzalez immediately sent back to Cuba? Why do you think there are specific immigration laws for certain countries that are different from the typical rules? So, pause me, answer that completely. We discussed that uh, uh, quite a bit, and we're moving on. All right, current issues with citizenship and, and, and things. This here is a predator drone, all right? Uh, so the war on terror in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, these unmanned aircraft would circle around way in the sky and when they saw bad guys, I'm using quotes like uh, uh, targets that needed to be blown up they get like launch a missile from like you can't even see it because it's so far up there uh and kablooey i also want to if you've ever thought about a predator they're not small these these are really big they're like little mini planes but there's nobody in there somebody in a joystick flying it somewhere in like kentucky um so the issue with the predator drones that, that comes out during barack obama's time in office all right uh is so if we fly these predator drones around in the Middle East, countries that we're at war with or, or have terrorists that are trying to hurt us. If America knows for sure, and that's a whole nother thing because they do sometimes get this wrong and it's baffling to me with people's lives. But when they know for sure there's a bad guy like over here and he's a terrorist and they, they can take him out right now and save all these lives, uh, the predator drones are given the permission, whoever's flying it, to, you know, <laughs> blow them up, like, like launch a missile at them, and they have neutralized the target because they want to use all these non-terms for ending people's lives. Anyway, so we had been doing this. Take, you know, keep America safe, take out terrorists. Well, the problem ended up becoming, people realized, wait a minute, you killed a couple people that were born in America. And they're like, Yo, yeah, we did, but they were American, they were like, oh, we hate America, and they traveled to the Middle East, and they're like, I want to be a terrorist now, and they were planning an attack on America, and the fact that they were a citizen, they could just come right back into America, and you know, may not send up any flags, and could have done, so they're a terrorist, and we knew they were going to do terrorist activity, so, so we, we took them out. We don't get a high five for that. And the issue ends up becoming, uh, no, you don't get a high five for that, and this is current controversy. That's an American citizen. And they're like, yeah, but they're a terrorist. True, not saying that there shouldn't be serious punishments, but because they're a citizen, they're bound by the Bill of Rights. 
they have due process. They have to be ar arrested, charged with their crime, and go through a court proceeding. They're not enemy combatants. Or let me rephrase that. Obama's like, yeah, but they're enemy combatants. And they're like, I, just because you call them an enemy combatant doesn't mean they revoke their citizenship. That's the whole point, because you could just call anybody you didn't like an enemy combatant, and then they no longer have citizenship. So these guys, while they're doing completely shady stuff, I don't think anybody's questioning that, they're just from the sky getting hit with a missile, and they have no idea what's, what's coming. So as a citizen of the United States, does the government have the, the right to decide when you no longer are protected under the Constitution? And that's what the predator drone strikes really, they're like, I just, let's use common sense. They're like, well, how about we look at the law? So it's real touchy with predator drones. Can you predator drone an American citizen, even if they're doing something directly negative to America? Now, if he was like planting a bomb at the time, you know, yes. But if he's just like going from one house to another, thinking he's probably, you know, coming up with plans for something, can you hit him? And, and, and the, the Supreme Court initially said, no, the, it, it's gone back and forth. So predator drones on how you deal with enemy combatants when they're American citizens, it has become a, a touchy point now uh, with citizenship and how the government interacts with them. So the question here is, why are the rules of military engagement? Basically, why is it different whether or not you can hit somebody with a missile uh, in another country different depending on whether or not they're an American citizen or if they're not. All right. Well, why is that such a big issue of whether or not they're a citizen or not before you can, you know, engage them militarily? All right. So answer that completely and we'll move on. It just keeps getting crazier today, people. You know who this dude is? Probably do. All right. If you don't know judgments, might be a good thing. This is Adolf Hitler, all right? You're like, is that the Holocaust dude? It is the Holocaust dude. Holocaust dude, let's just, ah, he's crazy, all right? We'll, we'll, we'll go into that in, in my US history stuff. We go in, into details of all of this other stuff, world history and US history. But here, let's just simplify a uh, bad guy. I don't do that often. We're just gonna simplify this. He's a bad guy. I think we can all agree on that here simply for, for this lesson, all right? Uh, his big goal was to have a master race of people, right? He thought the German people were the purest people. You should have a master race. He wanted all the guys to look like this, blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, granted, he's not blonde hair and blue eyes, but <laughs> let's not nitpick. I don't know. He had blonde hair, blue eyes. This is, this is Hitler's idea of the perfect guys. And then you got the blonde hair, blue eyes. This is, so men are supposed to look like this. Women are supposed to look like this. Well, how do you make that happen? Well, Hitler's not going to wait for luck. He says, we'll create the perfect race. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll create them? Like you're just going to go to a lab and like add parts together to make a perfect race? He says, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. We're just going to take out all the parts of the race that we don't like. He had a whole nother, now the Holocaust, people he didn't like. And for racial reasons, it absolutely gets a lot of, uh, and rightfully so, a lot of attention. He also created a program called eugenics. He didn't create a program. It had actually been around. But this is the idea that the people that you don't really like, now you might not want to go kill them, or that, that would be just too crazy, maybe even for Hitler. You forcefully sterilize them. Basically, the people that you don't want their genes to be passed on, you force them to not be able to have kids. Uh, like women is tying the tubes, guys, it's like cash. It's not like your whole, I mean, it's, it's a medical procedure, like put you to sleep or, or whatever. Uh, um, you know, guys, the snip sniffer or whatever is of, I should probably not uh, more appropriate term, but whatever. All right. Women get the tubes tied, uh, uh, uh guys make them sterile. Um, uh, so they can't have kids. So you don't in Hitler's mind ruin the gene pool. You're like, golly, this dude's a psycho. Well, at the end of World War II, America comes in, and Russia. I definitely want to give Russia credit here for that as well. Uh, they come in, and the Nazi uh, collapses. Oh, my gosh. Thank goodness. All that stuff like Holocaust went away. And they're like, yeah. America's like, the Holocaust was absolutely awful. And they're like, yeah, and all that stuff. Just, you know, taking people out and murdering them in the street. And America's like, yeah, that's awful. And like, and so glad we got rid of that thing of, of eugenics. And America's like, And they're like, what you mean, America? 
because America sees what Hitler did and says, you know what, it's a pretty good idea. Let that sink in for a second. America says all the other stuff he did was evil, but eugenics. And now Hitler and America kind of came up with the idea at the same time. It wasn't like we necessarily took it from him. He ran with it. So did America. Uh, there's the American Eugenics Society. Uh, there's a eugenics board. Their job is literally to defi define people in American society that they don't want to have kids and forcefully sterilize them to prevent them. <laughs> from, I, I, I laugh, but I, can't, I just can't believe that this happened in our society. Uh, and prevent them from having kids so that it doesn't ruin the gene pool for everybody else. The two states in America that were did most of this was California, who had the largest population, so that's not a huge surprise. Uh, they had the most, the second most, and the most uh, 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 per capita, North Carolina. That's right. North Carolina was first and foremost in the eugenics situation after World War II, uh, from the 50s to the 70s. All right. Uh, there's literally, like, this is, this is not making, this is, some people are born to be a burden on the rest. That is the mentality of a lot of people. So who gets sterilized? Uh, uh, criminals. Um, uh, epilepsy. That was a big one. If you had seizures, that was like a huge, it took, against your will, they would take you in, knock you out, and sterilize you where you can't have kids. It doesn't end your life, but you can never reproduce. Against your will. Uh, in North Carolina, all right, from 1930, like when Hitler stopped doing it, all right, Hitler died in 1945. America couldn't, or, and this is just North Carolina, 1950, 1955, 1960, up to 1963. And that's not how many per year, that is the total number. So like, in, it's not like in 1980, they stopped at 1963. That was the, the maximum amount, so it doesn't go up anymore from there. Uh, sterilizations. And the vast majority, over 90% of those sterilized were women. Even though it was easier to sterilize men, women were the ones that were more common. 90% to 10% were sterilized, and the vast majority were minorities. That's everything we've talked about. I can just imagine how shocked you are by that sarcasm. Uh, so minority women were targeted for sterilization to take their genes out of the gene pool in North Carolina after Hitler. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. And, and obviously there, there's protests that like, uh, they're basically saying the sterilization of mothers, uh, is inhumane. You're basically life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, like all this stuff. Uh, you're literally taking the ability to create life. Uh, uh, liberty, we don't have a choice in it, and a pursuit of happiness. There, there's a reason that humans, you know, reproduce, it, 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 it provides happiness. Now, I got two little kids. Most of the time, that's the case, you know, pros and cons. Uh, but uh, I say that jokingly. Anywho, the idea that this is taking place for a long time in America and North Carolina seems staggering. And you're like, golly. That's wild. I'm glad that was a long time ago. Whew. Whew. I'm glad that somebody came to their senses and said, we're not going to do it anymore. Well, really, by 1963, they decided to stop doing it because they felt pretty bad about it. They're, oh, we're not going to do it. What's even crazier is in North Carolina, it wasn't until 2003 that they outlawed forced sterilization. That ain't that long ago. Uh, and it, it, it is shocking to see these policies that the government set against citizens, basically forcefully sterilizing, preventing more citizens, uh, is 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 insane. Uh, and so this stuff still happens in, in modern society. Uh, but the, the question here, and we had just talked about this, how is eugenics a direct violation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Um, uh, so uh, answer that completely, and we're moving on. All right. Torture. What? We're all over the place today, Mr. Wagstaff. You're right, because these are the questions that come up. We're going back to Cuba. Has nothing to do with Alien Gonzalez. But long story short, we helped Cuba out in the Spanish-American War. 
after the Spanish American War, we're going to like let Cuba be their independent country, but we wanted in return, we wanted to have a naval base there at the turn of the century in 1900, and it's called Guantanamo Bay. Even though we start hating Cuba after this and we have big issues with them, Guantanamo Bay is American land in Cuba. You get there by boat, you leave by boat, you don't interact with the rest of the country. Fidel Castro also never messed with it because that's just an excuse for America to go to war. So we have a naval base in Guantanamo Bay. So the reason this is important is America likes to, you know, criticize other people for human rights, human rights violations. Uh, we see China do something, we see Russia do something, we de see a country in the Middle East do something, and America is quick to criticize them for human rights violations. So you would think we were going to criticize other people, you know, our home is pretty squeaky clean. Well, Guantanamo Bay is interesting. Because what is held at Guantanamo Bay are prisoners of war, especially with the war on terror. So if you're an enemy combatant, not an American citizen, and you're captured, that you're trying to have a terrorist attack, uh, you're going to be arrested, and you are brought to Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, not technically in America, but it's on American soil, in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, looking this up before I recorded this, there are 39, all right, um, 39 people still in Guantanamo Bay that will never even see a court date. They're just there forever, like life in prison. And they're never going to see the outside of the prison because they were a terrorist. And you're like, okay, no, 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 think about this. It would never happen if they're an American citizen. Why? They have to be tried by a jury of their peers. They have to be told what they've done wrong. If you're not a citizen of the United States, the United States government doesn't necessarily extend those rights to you. This is why citizenship is very important. It is a weapon to use to defend yourself uh, in, in, in times like this. These, now, now uh, before I, they're not good people. Uh, I, I, anywho, um, the people that are there, not only are they there and being held by America, it comes out like you can't torture people. Like America kind of after you know, some stuff that happened in, in Japan and, and uh, uh, um, after World War II, United Nations comes out and says, we can't have torture. America's like, absolutely, you can't have torture. Well, there's some stories start coming out of what's happening in Guantanamo Bay to some of these guys. And the rest of the world's like, America, are you torturing people down there? And they're like, no. And they're like, because we keep hearing you're torturing people. Like, we don't torture people. We use enhanced interrogation techniques. And the rest of the world in America says, says, says what, 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 what now? They're like, yes, enhanced interrogation. What does that mean? So they're like, well, we're not like hitting them with a hammer till they talk. Well, what are you doing? We're doing this thing called waterboarding, where we basically hold them down and pour water on their, hold a rag water. It symbolize, it in your brain, it makes you think you're drowning and there's no way to turn it off. Like if you swim too far in the bottom of the swimming pool and then you're swimming up and you're like, okay, I'm out of breath and ah, where's the top at? And that, that panic of I might drown. Waterboarding triggers that part in your brain and you can't stop it, you can't turn it off. Uh, and everybody's like, that's torture. And America's like, they're fine. They're like, that's the same thing as psychological torture. They're like, don't think so. They're, they walk away fine afterwards. Uh, and the rest of the world turns around and says, wait a minute, man. That's torture. And then America's like, <laughs> is it? it Y'all say, oh, yeah, 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 torture's bad. You're, you're, you know what? Water, water, I can't believe we ever allowed this to happen. <laughs> no more waterboarding. And Barack Obama uh, comes out, because this, this happened in the early 2000s, uh, uh, really with George uh, W. Bush was president. Uh, Barack Obama comes out, and it was kind of a hot but, uh, button topic around 2009. He says, America is not, no longer waterboarding. They classify it as torture. Absolutely, that's the right moral thing to do. Which kind of leaves it to, to weird because had nobody ever called him out on this, would they still be doing it? So the question is, do you think America stopped using torture, specifically waterboarding, because they realized it was wrong or because they got caught? Or a combination of the two. Uh, explain your opinion on that. Uh, so that's as far as we're going to get today. And uh, see you guys tomorrow.